Please be seated. Please turn with me in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 139. I'd say, pull out your bulletin, which you can, but at some point during, during the sermon, you will be left behind. And so, have your Bibles ready. I think the page number is in the bulletin, if I'm not mistaken. We're going to look at uh, a very famous psalm. Looking at my records, I think I've only preached on five or six psalms during Sunday mornings. So it's a bit of a rarity, but the psalms are rich in this one, very much so. And so please turn with me there, and I will pick up in verse 4. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. When we begin to study God's word, we find that God patiently corrects our thinking, especially in regards to our relationship with him. For example, at first we think to ourselves when we're young in the faith, I have chosen Jesus. And some of you, maybe this is one of your favorite songs, and if it is, I apologize at the beginning, but I'll explain to you why I'm not sorry at the end. But you know that song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? You know what I'm talking about? I won't sing it. But it is horrible. It is the absolute worst, and it will never be sung in this church. I know, and some of you are like, oh man, it is so catchy. You know? The reason I don't like it is because it is thoroughly unbiblical. Because we have not chosen Jesus. Look at what Jesus says in John 15, verse 16. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. I know I burst the bubble for a lot of you. You're like, man, man, that was really quick. I'm only just getting warmed up. When we're young in the faith, we think, how glad I am to have searched and found the Christian faith and have started to go to church, and now I'm taking things seriously. But then one day, we go and we hear a sermon on the parable of the lost sheep. And what do we discover? We're that lost sheep. And it is the shepherd, the great shepherd, Jesus, who has come and sought us out. And if you think that parable through, it it is a bit audacious, it is a bit ridiculous that the lost sheep would go and search out the shepherd. You see what God is revealing to us from his word. We used to think how grand it is now that I love God. Because there was a time when I didn't love God and I was distant and very cool towards him. But then we're studying through God's word and we come across 1 John 4.10 and we read the apostles' teaching. He says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And he sent his son as an anointing sacrifice for our sins. We used to think of our conversion as the time when we came to know the Lord. But then one day we stumbled across Psalm 139. And we read to our astonishment that God knew us before he even began the intricate work of weaving us together in our mother's womb. Well, this is astonishing. Such was the astonishment of Augustine, the great theologian of the fourth century. He recounts his conversion story in his spiritual autobiography known as Confessions. And if you've never read it, I would highly encourage you to do so. And he talks about discovering the fact that God had been laying a hold of him long before he had any idea. Right? Just look at one of the lines that I discovered or rediscovered as I pulled out my copy. Because as I was reading through Psalm 139, Augustine just kept on coming to my mind. And I opened it up. And I kid you not, it was one of the first pages, right? I opened up probably three-fourths through the, the book. I think it was page 166. And he is recounting his thankfulness for his mother, Monica. Because if you know the story, if you've read it, Monica would go to the church every day and be on her knees and pray for her son, that he would come to faith. And look at what he says. He says, Your servant, who brought me 
to birth, both in her body, so that I was born into the light of time, and in her heart, so that I was born into the light of eternity. I speak not of her gifts to me, but of your gifts to her. He's always going back to what God has done. And so how are we to understand what Augustine is saying? How are we to understand who is pursuing whom? How is it that Christ has been pursuing us like the scriptures tell us? Well, David gives us the answer in Psalm 139. And as we begin to sort our way through Psalm 139, we're going to see three important truths. We're going to find the fact of God, the threat of God, and finally the refuge of God. And so first, the fact of God. What sort of facts does David, the psalmist, give us about God? Well, let's take a look and find out. We read in verse 4, Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. Verse 8, we learn that there is no place that we can go, not up to heaven or down into Sheol, and God not be there. Verse 13 amazingly informs us that we wouldn't even be who we are today without God's handiwork. For David says, for you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. There is probably no better passage in all of God's word that deals with the doctrines of God's omnipresence, omni, uh, omnipotence, and omniscience. And those are fancy words. Omni means all, right? And so omnipresence, what do you think that means? All places. Omniscience. This is a little diff- difficult because omni from all, it come, the, the shins comes from gnosis in the Greek, which means knowledge. So all knowing, right? Omnipotent. What's that? All powerful. Just think about this. Before we can even utter a word, the Lord already knows it. That is the sort of God that we are dealing with, David says. Augustine alludes to this all powerful deity again in his confessions. But in chapter 11, on time and eternity, he gets specific. He does so by answering the age old question. What was God doing before he created anything at all? Before he created the heavens and the earth? His answer reveals that the very question assumes that God himself is subject to to time. And it neglects to consider that time itself is God's creation. And God is outside of it. Let me explain what I'm talking about. This is one of my favorite illustrations for this. But if you were to take a piece of paper, right just like this, and you were to draw a line from here to here, right? The beginning of the line represents the beginning of time, the beginning of creation. And the end of the line represents the end of time. Now, as you look at this timeline, you are seeing as God sees. For you can see the beginning just as well as the end, and everything in between all at the same time. Well, how is that possible? Because it's your creation, and you are outside of your creation. Augustine concludes this section on time and eternity with this prayer. He says, grant them, Lord, to consider carefully what they are saying when they ask what God was doing before he created anything, and to make the discovery that where there is no time, one cannot use the word never. To say that God has never done something is to say that there is no time when he did it. Let them therefore see that without the creation, no time can exist. Time goes together with matter. And let them cease to speak that vanity. And the reason we struggle with this is because we are time-bound creatures. And it's difficult for us to think outside of creation. Now, if you struggle with following that reasoning, let me give you a story from the, uh, the Sunday school room, okay? A Sunday school teacher once asked his class, I'll give you $100 if you can tell me where God lives. To which a young boy replied, I'll give you $1,000 if you can tell me where he doesn't live. (laughs) Isn't that actually, I love that. Uh, It's very witty and very true. And this is the message of Psalm 139. And we are the beneficiaries of this marvelous truth. And as David said in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Though the fact that God's presence is wonderful, it also creates a problem. And that leads us to our second point, which is the threat of God. 
David understood just how powerful and ever-present God is. And that fact led him to conclude in verses 5 and 7. You hem me in behind and before and, let, or, and lay your hand upon me. Where shall I go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? The word hem is found in the book of Job. Job, you remember, God allowed Satan to have his way with him. And he says, you've hemmed me in. You've walled me in is what he's done. But this word to flee, that actually comes from the the book of Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah? Do you remember what Jonah famously tried to do? He tried to flee from God. Was he successful? No. Even though David is marveling at God's omnipresence in this passage, his words of being hemmed in and being unable to flee reveal just how threatening God's presence is. Now, if David and Jonah were threatened by this God. What do you think about our Western culture? Do you think our Western culture might be threatened by this all-powerful being? You know, our issue as humans is that we are prone to taking something good and making it an ultimate thing. Take, for example, the good idea of a democratic society. I think all of us would agree of the governments that exist, the democratic society is the best one that's out there. This system is known as democratic political self-determination. What's that? It's the idea that we should be able to choose our own leaders and government. And if you don't believe that this was, you know, going on since the beginning of our our country's start, go back and study uh, the revolutionary uh, fathers. And you will see this is very much their hearts. And let's be honest. We want to pick the sort of leaders in government that will enable us to be ourselves, to live as we see fit. And if we don't have the freedom to live as we so desire, well, then all of a sudden we get a little grumpy, don't we? And life becomes meaningless. And that's how we all are. Why? Because that is what our culture teaches us. And this has been going on for centuries for us good Americans. And if that is our understanding of life and the filter by which we understand our reality, well then all this talk of an omni-God who is all-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful, well that's a nightmare. Why? Because such a God would be a threat to the freedom that we all hold so dear. It led the famous French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre to conclude this in his essay, on being and nothingness. He says, if there is a God, we can't be free. If there is a God who sees everything, then we are dehumanized. If there is a God who controls everything, well, that's unconscionable. And if we are free, then there is no God. And if there is a God, then we are not free. This is the reason why so many of us want to escape this all-powerful deity. We don't want to believe that he exists, because if he does, then he is a threat to the idea that we can live however we see fit. And in response, we think, get me out of here, right? Because I want to be me. Thus, we either deny that such a God exists, or we water down what the Bible teaches us about him. Is that not our Western culture writ large? Oh, he doesn't exist. Or let's just, you know, treat Scripture like a spiritual buffet. I'll take a little bit of love because love is so good. But all this wrath, no, 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 I'll leave that there. That's, that's like the Brussels sprouts of the Bible. Can't have that. Right? It's what we see. But if God is everywhere, but then it's going to be a, a, a little tricky to lose him, isn't it? This is what David experienced and what Sartre called the ambivalence of trying to escape God. Look at what David says in verses 7 through 10 where he asks the rhetorical question, How can I get away from you? If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there waiting. But then suddenly in verse 10, David says, Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. But it's crazy because he's talking about fleeing, but then all of a sudden, I'm thankful for your hand. Did anyone notice the change in his tone? He's just been saying, I want to be free. I want to be free. And then I want the hand. Well, what does David want? Well, he wants what we all want. He wants a hand that will guide us through the dark. He wants a hand that will hold us up 
so that we do not fall and plummet. You ever have that where you're about to fall asleep and like you, you feel like all of a sudden you're just flying through the air and you catch yourself and you jerk? You ever do that? Or is that just me? Am I just a freak? That's not a good feeling. You want someone to hold you, don't you? That's why you brace yourself. This is where Sartre ran into trouble because, you see, he wanted that hand as well. Listen to what he concluded in his famous lecture on existentialism in 1946. He says this, Around 1880, the French professor said that God is a useless hypothesis, so we will do without it. But if we are to have a society, they said, it is essential that certain values be taken seriously. There must be a priori values. Now, there we go, a priori. We're dealing with Kant. A priori means cause and effect. It means absolute truths. It means truth that we come at that can't be derived from experience, right? That's a priori. And this is what we see. He says, therefore, we must believe in a priori existence ascribed to them. That is, to be honest, not to lie, not to beat one's wife, to bring up children, and so forth. These values exist, although, of course, there is no God. However, the existentialist finds it extremely embarrassing that God does not exist, for there disappears with God all possibility of finding anything good a priori. Dostoevsky once wrote, If God does not exist, then anything is permissible. And that, for the existentialist, is the starting point. Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist, for all moral statements are at the human level, and all opinions are equal. And man, therefore, is in consequence forlorn, for he cannot find anything to depend on, either within or without. In other words, man is free, but as a result, he is condemned to be free. Sartre is saying, if you want to be free, then that means there is no hand to hold or to guide you. There are no moral absolutes. Now, Sartre received a lot of flack because he could not live consistently with his own idea. And he condemned certain things which he thought were morally wrong. And people pointed back and said, no, 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 no. You're being inconsistent. That's not what you said. What's going on? Sartre was trying to escape the inescapable. He was trying to get away, and yet he couldn't escape because he still wanted the hand. So you see, the presence of God is an, an inescapable fact, and yet it's also a radical threat. And this is our plight. We can't live with God, and we can't live without him. We're all doing this. We're trying to escape the inescapable. And you say, not me, preacher. And I'd like to ask your spouse, is that true? <laughs> Do they not sin? So what can be done? Well, that leads us to point three, the refuge of God. We find this refuge in the final verses of the psalm. This is where I say, and if you don't have your Bible out, you're going to be left behind. And the lectionary authors, they omitted it, and that's why we need to turn to the Bibles. And so you'll see it. Look at verse 19, and then drop down to verses 23 through 24. But this is where the refuge is, and let me just read it for us. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O men of blood, depart from me. Yeah, so I'm not surprised that the lectionary authors cut that out, right? Because that seemingly doesn't go along with the flow of the passage, you know? It's like, whoa. But then drop down to verses 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the everlasting way. What is David saying? David recognizes that even though he desires to steer clear of evil people and of their evil ways, that he cannot do anything about the evil that's inside of him. He can't steer clear of that, right? In fact, the reason he wants to stay away from evil people and their evil ways is not because he's so good but because he recognizes that he's that bad and that if he gets around them, he's going to fall into the same thing. So he appeals to God to search him out in order to be helped by God's hand in God's everlasting way. Ironically, we Westerners put freedom in the place of God, and in the end, we become ensnared. We fall away from God. We turn away from him. We run away from him, and guess what we lose? We lose our freedom, and it's like an addiction. 
We can never get enough, and we keep on going back, and it's never satisfying. It is only when we turn to God and say, yeah, I cannot trust myself. Please reveal to me where I am turning away from you, that you might grab me and pull me back to yourself, for you are the place of true freedom. For when we begin to study God's word, we find that God patiently corrects our thinking, especially in regards to our relationship with him. Do we desire freedom? Freedom doesn't exist with the exception of in God. Do we desire to discover our full potential? Well, if David is right, and the God that we are dealing with is this all-knowing, all-present, and all-powerful being, well, then we will never discover our full potential if we don't somehow connect with, with him, turn to him. I learned an interesting fact in my sermon preparation about the Hubble telescope. You all remember the Hubble telescope? Still out there floating about. But it found a galaxy some 13.4 billion light years away. It's been calculated that if we were to travel 500 miles per hour, nonstop, every day, 24-7, do you know how long it would take us to get there? 20 quadrillion years. <laughs> that's 15 zeros after the 20. Now, that's a long road trip but not for God. Because remember the illustration of the paper? He is outside of it. And so we are just blown away by that, but not God, because he is omnipresent. He is everywhere at once, which is what led the Apostle Paul to say in Romans 8, verses 38 through 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But how can we know that? Because God showed us in his son, Jesus Christ. And I was preparing this. I was struck by something. You all know the, or remember the story of Jairus' daughter? Remember that? She was sick. And Jairus, who was, I think, the temple, uh, he had something to do with the temple. Uh, he was one of the temple authorities. He's like, I need to get this Jesus because he's been healing people. And he goes off. And he's trying to get to him. But then Jesus gets into the crowd. You remember that, that woman with the bleeding disorder for 12 years? You know? And, and can you imagine, Jairus, your, your, your little child is sick, and you're like, Jesus, we got to go. And he's sitting here dealing with this lady who's got this bleeding disorder. And, of course, he heals her, and this is an amazing story of his own. But he gets going, and the servant comes and says, don't bother. She's already dead. Do you remember what Jesus did? Do you remember what he does? He goes into the house. He goes into the room. And in Mark 5.41, he goes up to the little girl. He says, Talitha Kumi. Which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And Jesus reached into death itself. And he pulled her back to life. In the same way that we go to our little children and we say, hey, little buddy. It's time to get up. Can you not hear David saying in verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. God the Father is able to pull us out of death because on the cross he let go of his son Jesus Christ so that he could lay hold of you and me. Jesus on the cross had all of our darkness, all of our sin fall upon him so that we could be filled with this glorious light. Now, if that's the kind of God that we're dealing with, don't you think that he's proven that he's trustworthy? I don't know about you, but God is saying, Matt, put your trust in me today. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, I pray, Lord, whatever is on our hearts, whatever anxiety we are focused on, I pray that right now you would send your Holy Spirit to quicken us, to recognize who you are. And we thank you for your patience and grace in guiding us along to revealing us who you really are. Help us not be anxious, but help us join the great adventure that you are calling us to. And help us point others to your glorious reality.
And so again we pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come Holy Spirit, come. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.